of any religious discussion. It is the task of the world religions to give an answer to this question of God's justice on one hand and the injustices in this world. The critical theory of religion in many ways acts as ideology critique. Um, through it, we can see that which is untrue. Um, and also within that, uh, we see which, that which is true as well. And when we get rid of the false consciousness, when we get rid of the false notions, the false ideas uh, among the religions, among the secular, that opens up uh, a place for discourse among the world religions. He's the creator of this category, this study of the critical theory of religion. It has its roots definitely in, in what kind of Adorno and Benjamin and Tom and early critical theorists and Habermas as well, second generation. Um, but it's Professor Siebert that has uh, introduced this uh, topic, this thing of the critical theory of religion. Not only as a historical uh, study, but also something that uh, is in the forefront of the discussion uh, of creating this better future uh, society of reconciliation. I think the world religions have an important role because there will be no peace among the nations without peace among the religions and there will be no peace among the world religions without discourse among them and they cannot have a discourse without understanding each other's uh, um, interpretation of reality and orientation of action. A new film from Moondog Productions, exploring the future of religion, religious faith, and secular rationality, is the story of the life and work of Rudolf J. Siebert. If your university or college is interested in obtaining this series of DVDs for use in your curriculum, or for more information on how to participate in the funding of this important project, go to www.rudolfjsiebert.org. Okay, now you saw it in a little box, so to speak. Okay, let's do the following thing. First of all, we have to decide, do we want to come here, or do you want to come to my house? Let's go to your house. Okay. You are very much invited, but we want to have a democratic vote, so we must make sure that everybody can come. It is on West Michigan, and... Uh, how can we describe it? Little small. Here. Hmm? Yeah, it, it's uh, Piccadilly. So you go to West Piccadilly Michigan. Road. Yeah, one road before, one line before you get to Drake. Take a right, couple houses on the, What's on the, the right. What's the bagel shop there on the corner? Big Apple Bagel. Yeah. Right there, yeah. So we all know. I have no problem with that. Uh, all I just need is the number street and I'll Google it. Yeah, 630 Piccadilly. Sacred Circus. <laughs> so if you're in London, yes, there's right. a particular book you want to read of Dr. Stevens, you'll yeah. never forget his address ever again. <laughs> 630 <laughs> Piccadilly. Description of the mall wine and... Oh, no, no, this is 6.30 Piccadilly, about yeah. 50 times in the, in the chapter. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I do this. All the addresses are very important. Uh-huh. Yeah, all the all stories are full of addresses. It was the center of the anti-Vietnam yeah. war, you know. Right. In Kalamazoo. Yeah. <laughs> the Gestapo was there, or the, what is it, the FBI was there. They <laughs> were sitting for weeks and weeks in front of the house. and uh, Okay. Very good. Now, let me just finish that up. We started out, it's unbelievable, we started out with this, the end of idolatry. Is there anything about this still that you would like to discuss? It has something to do with the right and the left. We discussed that, right? So, what the article is about is now we have the left in there. And um, we have to predict somehow that the right will also grow. But the left has a great chance now in the next uh, four years or next eight years and so on. But in which direction? So who is in now are the Roosevelt liberals. So they will make a new deal as we predicted, you know, for years and years. We had a choice and the American people, you know, were so disgusted with the neoliberals that they, they didn't like maybe the left, but they did vote in the left. And the left means, as we said here, that the new deal will be renewed. And um, that means the president has now even a problem with his own party because he wants to get $700 billion through and there are Democrats who are, you know, frightened by this. And so, but they will give in. They will give in. So it will be a new, new deal. 
1934, Roosevelt mentioned that word New Deal. And that means public works, you know, Wilhelm Street, schools will be built, and, and so on and so on. It will be no, Keynesianism. No, yeah. No, Right. It will uh, return, you know, from behind Friedman and Chicago School to Keynes again, and uh, high government spending, you know, in order to bring the economy uh, moving again. That's so right. But uh, when we have a historical concept, we know that the New Deal, the first one, did not rescue capitalism. Right. What rescued capitalism was the Second World War. So um, also nasty things like the promotion by Roosevelt of the war. Um, pushing the war, uh, sending war material to England and the Land Lease Act, an unbelievable thing. They were on loan, the tanks and the airplanes were all on loan. They were supposed to be given back. How, how one can give tanks and airplanes back after they have been used is, is a great question. And so, but he got through with it. And so it was intentionally, and, and, uh, but he was a great man, Roosevelt, but he had his start and shady size as well. But it was this war which finally brought people back into employment fully. <laughs> what the New Deal really did, it bridged the time from 39 to 39 or 40, and um, so giving people some honor, they could go to work and uh, got a dollar an hour or whatever, build the harbors of New Haven and, and, uh, and so on here, the, the lake coast, and um, uh, together with the Marines and, and the Army and so on. <laughs> so, but it did not rescue capitalism. So, therefore, we see also what you see in, the, in Europe, how left is Obama, you know, is the question, what afterwards? And the great temptation will be that if there is a certain stabilization at the end of this year and end of two years, that people say, okay, now we can have the free market again, and they begin to deregulate again, and will only glide into deeper uh, depression than we will have during this year. And so, therefore, it is really finished. That means capitalism is finished. The question is then, you know, what to do next? And um, as you see it in, in, in Bush, I mean, one honest thing about Bush was that he was a free marketeer. And then he comes in the last three months and says, you know, I was a free market man, but I have to tell you that the market did not work, and so on. And then did the, uh, anything that is hostile to any free market person, he began to federalize. Federalizing banks. So when you, uh, when you hear, you know, bailing out, that's a euphemism. He does not bail out. Wherever they put billions in, they own. The government owns. They buy up stocks or whatever they do but they take over. In Europe, it is even more radical in England. They fired all the CEOs. Here we left them in, yeah. but they will, um, they will have offices, federal offices in General Motors and, and the banks and so on, and the CEOs have to go daily to, as it was in the Second World War, have to go to these uh, federal functionaries and tell them what they will do and they will be allowed to do it or not allowed to do it and, and so on. And um, it has shown already, you know, that the banks got money and didn't give it for loans and so on, so that they don't play along what they are supposed to do. So that means that a much more greater machinery of enforcement and so on has to be put in, and the guys have to be put into prison if they don't obey and so on. And so that will go on for some time under Obama, but then what? Um, so far, not only Fox News say it is only to rescue the free market. That means you do the opposite of the free market in order to rescue it. Now that contradiction you know, cannot stand. So Fox News say that? that yeah, the right. Well, they all have this longing that you know that the free market could be established after the crisis is over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in reality, what we can, what uh, and there is the question now. You know, in the end of Obama after four or eight years. Um, if that federalization is not cancelled and we, uh, we uh, deregulate again and fall into a new uh, catastrophe, if we uh, do federalize as, for instance, the uh, uh, Perron did, you know, uh, that means a fascist nationalization, and Eva Perron and, you know, her songs, you know, the song of Eva Perron, a prostitute who became a saint, really, so she becomes a symbol for the masses, but these masses have nothing to say. That means it's corporatism. It's the government and the corporation who make our decisions. That's one way how it goes go. The other way is the Venezuela, Chavez way. That means uh, uh, government uh, control, but uh, with a strong pressure by the masses of the workers. 180 million through the labor unions or whatever will co-determine together with the corporate leaders and the government what will happen. That would be socialism then. 
Oh, now they talk about socialism already, you know, when they talk about nationalization of federal debt is socialism. It's a small part of socialism. It will mean much uh, different things, you know, psychologically very difficult in this country, sociologically very di difficult, but also culturally. <coughs> the idea, you know, that the individual has, like Munchausen, you know, has to pull himself by his own hairs out of his mess and so on. Um, the lack of solidarity uh, um, overall as a culture. That's why we don't have uh, national health insurance. Or we will have national health insurance in the next four years. And so on. No matter if McCain would have come in, we would have had it also because the power elite, the corporate, power, power, corporate uh, owning class, finds these costs too expensive. If you have to put $3,000 in every car for health insurance and so on, it's unbearable. So they will push it all on the federal government. Then the question is if they mess it up and make a combination between the federal government and the individual and the, and the insurance companies and so on. So the whole assistance against uh, Clinton in the first administration when she wanted to introduce that will probably come up again but weaker this time because of the catastrophe so they will get it through but that is also not all socialism socialism is much more it would be a concrete type of a liberalism what does it mean that's a Hegelian type of thing abstract is when, uh, when liberalism is simply atomistic it emphasizes the individual and nothing else now, if you mediate this individual with community in terms of a communitarianism and, and so on, then, and to try to uh, balance, then you make it concrete. Um, in the Nazi time, the, the, the Gestapo could recognize a socialist by how many times he used the word concrete. So the Gestapo officer was sitting there and counting it, concrete, 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 because civil society is abstract abstract in the sense that it's individualistic, it's one-sided and untrue according to this type of a logic. So if you mediate it with its opposite, with solidarity, or subsidiarity and so on, then you balance it and so on. This balance will be very hard uh, in terms of things. To get over this thought, you know, that maybe instead of free market we need a social market and that's so Like the Europeans do have it already, that we have to have a Montan Union. That means that all uh, gas, uh, electricity and so on, will all be in public hands. Simply because that individualist, that bourgeois guy, that guy who just stole 50 billion uh, from his own Jewish charity and, and so on. Or today somebody crashed himself, one of the guys crashed himself in the airplane and didn't even kill himself. He was so good a flyer he was. So now they caught him and he also cheated innumerable people and so on. So there are thousands of them. So that all will have to disappear. I wonder to what extent, for instance, you know, it was exactly this individualistic thing which made America so attractive, you know for others. There is a country where you can do what you want to. It was never true that way. One could never do really what one wanted. There was always some kind of a sheriff around and, and a judge so and so. But it was more than other. It was more individualistic than the civil society in England or in France or in, in Germany and so on. So that will be a tremendous transformation on the psychological level, social psychological level, sociological and cultural anthropological level and so on. So uh, and, uh, but this choice has not been made. I think, uh, you know, in terms of the critical theory, we made the right choice, the country made the right choice this time. There was nothing other to be done than this. But it will not be enough. It will, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, you know, in his head the fish sticks first, but uh, what is in the head, you can also see what is ahead and what somebody can do. So how left is uh, Obama? Not too left. So there will be limits to his leftishness. <laughs> it's big. Oh, uh, I agree. Right. So, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're here. Yeah. Well, he was not entirely wrong. So, <laughs> never, so there, there will be limits, and, and the limits will be that that we cannot go back to the free market. That uh, capitalistic ownership will be cancelled to a large extent. But what one can hope for is that there will be a private sector for pizzas and for restaurants and for toilet paper and all kinds of things which a society could maybe do without. As well, toilet paper, I'm not so sure because our experience there in Yalda was 
No, oh, but they, they have no toilets, and then you really know what civilization mm -hmm. is. And, I took and, pictures of them, so if you want to see it. Right. Well, it's what he called the New York Chamber. Chamber. Same station tour. Yeah, yeah same right. type of thing, yeah. Exactly. If he took pictures of it, it will be in the movie there. You <laughs> 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 mean the, the squat over it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Commonly referred and, to as the torture. And the door is hanging out there, and so on. So, nevertheless, okay. So, uh, that will be another, but hopefully, you know, that, I mean, maybe Obama, you know, 250,000, so that one lets the private sector go to 250,000. I think they could go to 2 million, too, with McCain. It would not do harm. These pizza guys, they have not ruined the country. It is uh, the guys above that, you know, the middle bourgeoisie and then the high bourgeoisie, out of control. Uh, even uh, George Soros, you know, who pays out people in Dubrovnik and, and Yalta to the, the eastern ones are paid, not the western ones, but um, he wrote a book, Why Things Went So Wrong in, uh, in Russia, you know, with the, uh, after 1989, and he says, you know, lack of state control. That means he, a speculator of currencies, you know, needs state control. They commit suicide. The bourgeoisie commits suicide if it has no state control. So, in sociologically evolutionary terms, we need more differentiation between civil society and the family, between civil society and the state. The state's sovereignty towards civil society is too small, is too, is too weak. And that has something to do, families came over here from Europe, you know, and they established villages and little towns. When the ruling class developed, uh, some of them left, went west across the Mississippi and so on and so on and so on. And uh, only slowly a sheriff disappeared and the sheriff was in the hand of the most strongest guy and it was all resting on revolvers, the whole thing. And slowly the sheriff was connected with the judge who was hundreds of miles away. And so slowly a state organization develops. But even during the revolution, you know, when, when Lincoln, for instance, canceled the Habeas Corpus Act, you know, and marched with his troop into Baltimore, and the general could shoot whomever he wants to without any uh, thing, shows, you know, he did not do that out of uh, mischief or whatever, but the two neighboring states wanted to secede. So the only thing to rescue that center, you know, was these horrible, you know, immoral, unlegal type of, of measures. And then they put the capital you know, into the swamps. I mean, you cannot live there in Washington during the summer. And that shows the whole contempt for this. So there is something anarchical, you know, in, the, in civil society, particularly in American civil society. And the taming of this, you know, will be a painful type of a thing, you know. The... the idea, you know, that the state should be a night watchman is a wonderful idea of the liberals. And every time when a new government came in, there were new buildings in Washington. Uh, they said, you know, we will have less government, and then there was a new building and so on. That means there's an objective dynamic, an objective sociological dynamic, which forces them all to do the same thing. And this one, against their will, you know, and this was a fantastic thing, against their will, they had suddenly to start to nationalize and to federalize. To the point that they want to cancel all private banks, or that means to federalize all banks, so we would only have federal banks, except these, these little banks, you know, which are a socialistic thing here, these, these teachers. Credit unions? Uh, credit unions, yeah. When the last Great Depression, they came up, they were built, and that was the only thing that survived socialistically. All the socialistic uh, productive enterprises did not work. They all faltered when capitalism came back. But, but these credit units, you know, they, they went on. So, so, I mean, it would be desirable that a private sector would remain. But the genius is to how to balance this. How to balance the initiative of these guys who have good ideas and push some project forwards. So uh, you have to keep them like cows who give milk. In order to give milk, you have to let them feed something. So you have to give them some profit. Otherwise, they don't work. They don't function. So you have to. So and there should be probably some room, and, and with a with a limit, an upper limit, further than this, you cannot go. If we could handle this, because if we would go, you know, further than this into a totalitarian type of a state uh, issue, you know, and that would not be very desirable. We don't want to imitate the Soviet Union or whatever. And uh, so, so this, um, you wouldn't mind? <laughs> it wasn't so bad after all. I mean, there are, there are a lot of people who... Yeah. You know, no, there's, room, there's a whole lot of room for planning, especially if yeah, you have so much. Right, yeah. And then I mean, so there are a lot of people, you know, when we meet them there in, in uh, Yalta and so on, in Croatia too, 
uh, who think back, you know, to the socialist time when they had stability and they had their pension. It wasn't much, you know. I mean, no way. No ethnic cleansing, either. Yeah, right. Yeah. So the nationalistic thing had not come up, and and, and so on. So they were some, which uh, you know, it, I I will eternally credit that. Uh, it was not possible in West Germany, for instance, to follow the constitution, you know, and have a constitutional assembly uh, in order to unite the two parts, because then one could have had some of the good things, you know, which they, these people worked out, uh, could have saved this, and, and it wouldn't have been that robbery, you know. So, nevertheless, that is, you know, this isn't this article, a certain projection, you know, what, and, and particularly, it would be interesting to see what the left can do, that it is not so split up in itself and in terms of themes of ecology and other things, so they cannot focus, you know, that would be very sad. But it is uh, definitely for the left, you know, a grace period where they can have influence now. Well, on, on this, I, I had a comment about yeah. the, the, how the metaphor is a little difficult mm -hmm. with a new New Deal. Yeah. The, the, the idea that drove the original New Deal yeah. was not necessarily government initiative. Yeah. Roosevelt always drag, dragged his feet. Yeah. It was an active militant labor movement yeah. that forced the government's hand to do as much as they did. Right. So uh, the, all they wanted to pass was the National Recovery Act, yeah. which was the first one that fell on its face. Yeah. Militant labor forced the government to right. come up with all of this yeah. social security, uh, national yeah. uh, labor relations act, recognized unions, all this. So, yeah. but so today, in our current situation, we have no militant labor movement. Yeah. So you have a, uh, a a liberal, maybe possibly welfare state oriented uh, party in power, maybe yeah. without. Uh, a militant labor yeah. movement to push it on. So then, what do you get? Yeah. So you have no. So is it then Peronism yeah, right, with right. no voice that for labor? Because so labor is doing absolutely it's nothing, or it's point. reactionary and it's right. uh, protectionist. Yeah, right. That is a great danger. So the, the, the government will do, I think, the next week, a certain thing. They will dissolve Guantanamo Bay. Um, they will put an embassy into Iran, they will put uh, an ambassador into the embassy in Syria, which is uh, vacant for years and years. Well, so you little know. things they will do, and they will make some laws which will strengthen the labor unions to, to make it easier for them to organize, and so on. If that will be enough, it is, yeah, still, partly, yeah. it is a question. Oh, yeah. Nobody's getting rid of I know. Yeah. I yeah, oh no, it would be beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. But it will be a question, you know, then of the initiative of the workers themselves. And if the masses do not put that pressure, which you just described, you know, on, on the government, then it will be go the Perron way. So, but uh, I think there is an opening for for this uh, for the left or for this worker movement. And so, uh, it depends how much they are pissed off, so to speak, you know, for what has happened or what's happening to them in terms of unemployment going up to 7.2, 7.49, 9, or whatever, how, and the pensions, and so on, but how angry really they being, get. Is it really being pissed off? Because we know industry, we know piss off, piss, you know, yeah. people are very pissed off, but it's only when they're able to, to take that being pissed off and crystallize it into a social organization, exactly, and yeah, that yeah, directed... Yeah organized, exactly, yeah. Leninist, yeah. if you want yeah. to, and then they do something. Yeah, otherwise it will, you know, the equation will turn against each other and, and into the families and, and, and so on, and it will just, uh, will not be effective, so. But it is accumulating, you know, and they are somewhat frightened of, of it, and it should be expected. Okay, so that was the main thing, and uh, uh, let's uh, put this aside. Um, is there anything, how far I came the last time, I think I told you something about my background, we have a summary of there. Um, so uh, the, I don't have to say much more. I think I came to the point where I was, you know, went in the Air Force and describes this there. Um, I didn't want to go, and then the officer said I had no chance and no choice, and then I was trained, you know, first with this flag artillery thing which you saw there, but also with the ME-109 
and um, I, for two years I, I did this and uh, from 1943 on to 1944 and then there were no airplanes anymore and then I went to the infantry and became an infantry officer and I was supposed to march to Russia and but it was too late uh, General Patton marched through Worms and to, uh, to Frankfurt and so I was thrown against him and I fought about two weeks or so against his army and um, so the um, let me just tell you some experience which uh, you know because what we said is that the critical theory is a response to something real it's a response to the catastrophe of the first world war the catastrophe of fascism the catastrophe of, of the second world war that means as cultivated people how can this happen that they put you and kill each other and so on. and of course Schopenhauer and uh, they, they tried you know Schopenhauer and Marx and Nietzsche and so on, if they could get help from them in order to explain what was happening because if you cannot analyze it right if you cannot diagnose it right you will not have a prognosis and you will not have a therapy or whatever so that is what the whole enterprise is about and what is all about this uh, non-conformism it is not just anger and babbling about how bad the world is and so on, but to find the causes like the cause of cancer or so and then to find uh, certain uh, suggest certain therapies which can only come about through the analysis only through the analysis you can find out not simply fi fantasizing something up but uh, so when you talk about I'll turn to future number three uh, the reconciled society you know, reconciling of what namely of these particular antagonisms which you have on the website now and then I will um, well, show you, I could give you the address there. So, uh, nevertheless, to uh, to see what the experiences are there. So, in the infantry there, for instance, I um, uh, was sent over from uh, a little town where the barracks were and where I had trained. So, I had been trained there for a few months and particularly going to winter. Therefore, I can, after all, I can march through the snow because I was uh, at a sleep in it and uh, crawl in it and whatever and um, so uh, but uh, I marched in the city of Alsen now and um, there you know Patton was there already and the flags white flags were hanging out and people were so happy that the war was over for them and then you know I came in there with 250 people and as I was a lieutenant the company and, and then others of course and including Hungarians um, officers who were allied and so they had to take the flags down again and uh, the Germans themselves you know wished we had vanished and uh, so I remember they took me in maybe an hour and made some scrambled eggs and then said please leave again please leave again we were their own sons and were young and they didn't want to be harsh with us but where we were the war was and, and so on so some let me sleep in their bed in big farmer beds with the feather beds and so on and so on for two hours and then please go again and so, so. Um, nevertheless what, what is important with our situation now um, you know how much peace is there in the middle of the war how much civilization survives um, and people say you know Patton was a very brutal guy and he uh, abused his people and beat them up he did beat up some of them but um, as far as I saw he had these weapons in the, the Air Force came first and then came the tanks and so, so then came the infantry he saved his own people like you know he could afford to save his own people uh, you know Marshal General Marshal Stalin could not afford that and most European armies could not afford it the same way the death penalty you know they all had the death penalty uh, the American army had one whom they executed probably a few more than the one from Chicago but um, they could afford you know not to be so so rigorous and, and so on so but when I when we finally you know the, um, the um, he had to withdraw and uh, and well, we took over the town and uh, he, he had to flee so fast that he had to leave his hospital there and in the hospital there were German prisoners where they, they were treated the same way by the American doctors who were also prisoners now as is the Americans were and when that was turned around and we took over the Americans were now prisoners the others were free but they were all still sick and they got the same medicine and the same operations and, and so on and so on so and there was no question you know about uh, about uh, uh, um, keeping those Geneva conventions or not and that is not a matter of morality it was simply a matter of calculation if you would do that 
the others would have a right to do that too and so on. So it happened two things at the same time. Trayson, of course, was bombarded three times in the American attack in the morning. A horrible butchery, an unbelievable type of a butchery. And um, one doesn't know exactly what the reason for it was. And afterwards Hitler wanted to cancel, like Bush uh, did in the last years, cancel the Geneva Convention. And, uh, and the general said, you know, if you do that, that means he would have killed all the pilots, British and American pilots, and all the, there are thousands of them in German prisons. And uh, the German generals made it clear to him that if you do that, of course, they will do the same thing with the, you know, Hitler wouldn't maybe care or whatever, but his generals prevented it. And with Churchill it was the same thing when, when the SS colonel, Werner von Braun, he was an SS colonel, if he, uh, when he uh, sent these rockets from Peenemünde over to London, then Churchill wanted to put gas into the bombs, and he wanted to gas the whole German territory. And, and uh, also the Admiralty had a hard time to convince him that this was a bad idea, because then gas would come over uh, in the rockets, and maybe worse, because they didn't know if Heisenberg had developed the bombs or not, or if the Germans had enough electricity for a long time, I thought the Germans like Heisenberg had hesitated to bomb, to build the bomb. But then I had an uncle in the Max Planck Institute and I was enlightened that uh, they would have liked to do the bomb, but they did not have enough electricity to build the bomb. And so, but they never knew, you know, if there would not be a sudden atomic head on one of these bombs, then that would be the end of London. So, um, therefore, they were finally they convinced him that gas was not uh, used. And there you have, a, uh, you know, as pessimistic as Schopenhauerian, the good you theory may be, there is also some optimism which is based in reality because all had gas and nobody used the gas. So, that means it makes sense sometimes to evolve international law uh, and, and uh, it can hold, you know. Uh, and maybe that gas thing is after Fritz Haber invented it. Um, you know, in the First World War, it was not used in the Second World War by anybody. But after the war, it was used by Saddam Hussein, and we gave it to him, the busted gas, which uh, Harbour, Fritz Harbour had invented. <laughs> okay, so that was one thing. But another thing, too, when I surrendered, you know, um, <coughs> when one part surrenders to the other, um, and you had, you know, fierce type of battles before, uh, there is... Uh, of course, revenge, you know, retaliation is something very biological in us. And uh, that the, uh, the law of war can motivate armies, you know, not to take revenge then, but to take somebody prisoner, and, and uh, like I was taken when I surrendered. There was a horrible battle in, in, in the uh, foreign, and let me just tell you this in order to uh, also um, address myself to the issue of nihilism. Because one fruit, you know, the First World War and Second World War, the people who came back, was this nihilism, this absolute meaninglessness. And let me tell you one of these meaningless stories, just one of them, an innumerable of one. Um, the, um, the area where, where I fought was on the way to Würzburg. Würzburg had been completely wiped out practically by the American Air Force before it was taken. So uh, Patton had already moved toward Würzburg and then he wanted to mop up all the side valleys because there could be counterattacks against this main stream. And so I was in one of those valleys. So he uh, came with his tanks, you know, and drove into this valley and we were celebrating the birthday of the innkeeper's daughter in a little restaurant there with champagne and so on, which in itself is already uh, some uh, idiotic type of thing, you know. There you have this butchery going on and there they celebrate the birthday, the 80th birthday of the innkeeper's daughter. And so the general, who um, belonged to the same uh, Catholic student organization as I did, he um, then said, well, uh, um, we're going to pause it and, and so on, you know, big celebration and hello and hello and whatever. And suddenly the first shots came through the window. So some GIs were shooting through the window. And he said, well, they are coming now. But let's tell them, the last time show them what German strategy and tactics means. So uh, he leaves and takes about 400, 500 men with him. He marches down the road behind the hill and comes up two miles up the road again and puts his people 
on a little hilly uh, above the road. And of course the Americans did not notice it. Uh, and so they came to the inn and near the inn there were bunkers. So they took flamethrowers and fried the people who were in the tanks. I mean, were in the, uh, were in the bunkers there. And then uh, it was uh, uh, 4 o'clock, 4.30 or so. The American army only fought to 5 o'clock because they were only paid to 5 o'clock. So they started at 8 and they stopped at 5. And so they just wanted to go to the next village there. And then they wanted to play cards, see some four lines, and uh, then they put the things there. This, what is it, what was it, 18, 1, 18, what was the caliber of these guns there? There was 12 millimeter and there was 18, what was it, 9, 8, 8 millimeters and 12, whatever. So they could be used for tanks and in the air, these same things there. So they put them in automatic and then they were shooting all night long and the machines, the, the, the guns were moving by themselves while they played cards and, and drank beer and that's that. So that's what they wanted to and, and of course the people in the village were very frightened and the little pigs were running out and the children were screaming because the enemy was coming. And they were particularly frightened of the blacks because the blacks were so black and, and the others, they looked familiar. And in spite of the fact that the blacks were the most friendly ones, usually with chocolate and, and so on. So, but they were, that's the image of the enemy. And so the people were horribly fine. So they marched, you know, the tanks in the middle, infantry right and left, you know, and the gun over the shoulder and the cigarette in the mouth. It was shortly before five o'clock. It was, the day was over, you know. And there, this general gives order now to shoot from that hill there. And for one, two minutes, you know, maybe two, three machine guns and all the other guns, 400, they shoot at these people down there. And then he gives the order to withdraw. And now came the trick. The tank barrels could only be lifted up a certain degree, not high enough in order to shoot above the hills. That was the German strategy. That was the tactics. Now all the guns, you know, from 30, 40 tanks were against the hill and they were shooting and shooting against the hill but behind the hill the 400 men were disappearing and there were no casualties. So that was a last trick or whatever to show the Americans what German strategy was, but what were the costs. Eight years later I came with my wife, I married my wife in, in Germany but we met here in the States and she was American and this third or fourth generation German uh, generation and so we went to that inn and I said to the innkeeper, it was the same innkeeper, of course he didn't recognize me anymore when you don't have a steel helmet on and a uniform then you look completely different and so um, I said do you remember the 18th birthday of your daughter? Yeah, he said yes the Germans were some soldiers were here and he said at night they shot all my cows because they thought they were tanks so they were sitting in his inn and shooting all his, his <laughs> cows in the dark, you know, all cows, like Shelley says, look black, and so it was all black. And so, and then they said, well, and they celebrated, yeah, and they drank all my champagne too, and uh, I said, well, what happened afterwards? He, well, then they all left, and then a few miles up the street, there was suddenly a horrible noise. Uh, I said, gunfire, yeah, gunfire. And then it all stopped. And I said, well, what happened then? Well, is it half an hour later, they brought all these, what is it called, body bags, body bags. And they put the body bags all in the yard of his inn. And I said, did you count the body bags? Yeah, he said, it was about 95. That means 95 young American soldiers who I bet did not even know where precisely they were or why they were where they were, and who were just going there now to, to rest in that village and so on, were just taken out from Texas, from Mexico, or whatever. I mean, what a horrifying type of thing, without any strategic sense, without any tactical sense. It did not uh, hinder, you know, any army to march anywhere or to Berlin. That's where Patton wanted to go originally, and at that time he still wanted to go to Berlin. Um, so that is for me the, the fundamental notion of what what meaninglessness and what senselessness uh, may mean. And so, if you experience something like that, you know, then um, it would be very easy that the commander of that unit to whom I did uh, surrender, you know, a few days later, 
would remember, you know, what has happened to them, the ambush, an ambush at them. But ambush is not against, it's not against the law of war. It is one permitted and uh, allowed tactic. But, uh, you know, you could be so wounded inside from that this has happened to you that you would now take revenge of somebody you suspect that he must have been involved in this on the other side. So, um, the... Um, Another thing, you know, where, where this meaning this comes from, the uh, um, uh, Hahnenkampf, the battle on the Hahnenkampf is also in the history books, and that's what I was involved in. And it happened that uh, in the morning, uh, um, the uh, four o'clock in the morning, the Hungarians suddenly deserted, and they went over to the American side without anybody noticing it. And so um, Patton used then about 80 tanks and drove into the flank, uh, and that would know, be very disorganizing. And so I told it was a Sunday, and I asked the people to, my soldiers, there to withdraw into the forest where the tanks could not follow. And there are big trees, the tanks cannot really easily drive through it. And so, uh, um, but they didn't anymore. They just walked back, you know, up the hill and, and uh, were taken out by the machine guns which were on the tanks and were all just mowed down. And only a very few came to that, uh, to that uh, forest and two of them were very much wounded and were dying and they were Catholics and they wanted to have uh, uh, the last rites. And there, there is a total profane type of a process, you know, the killing a butchering and suddenly the religion appears. There was no armor chaplain. So um, I thought, you know, the Americans now, it's, uh, it's late in, in the day and uh, they will not drive any further because it's soon five o'clock. And so I uh, left my weapons there with the two and, and went and wanted to get a pastor. I had this background on the Catholic Youth Movement and I thought that somebody dies, he should have the last fight. So I went to the next village and went to the pastor's house and got the old man. He had big glasses, could almost not see anything. So I dragged him, you know, over the hills and said that somebody's dying and, and he came right away and had the last sacraments for, for them and uh, so uh, he gave it to them. Both of them died during the night and uh, so then I thought I couldn't let the old man, you know, go back alone. He would stumble, it was getting night and so I took him back and we crossed one of these land roads there, small, and suddenly there came an SS commando, that means a motorcycle with a hangar on it, and three SS officers, and they were driving back and forth behind the front in order to catch people who would desert, because deserters. And I saw that in the moonshine there were people hanging there on the trees, boys and old men, and so So they came and said, what are you doing, and uh, you know, where are your weapons? And they just had a revolver that was not good enough. And uh, so they thought I was a deserter, and they began already to write out the, uh, the death certificate. And so, and so uh, just by accident, you know, my officer came, the high officer, the general came out of the bushes, a Bavarian with a horrible Bavarian accent, and uh, uh, he looked at it, looked at the situation, and uh, he would not have been powerful enough against his S officers if they are that really wild. So, but therefore he made it a laughing matter. He put my steel helmet down and my face disappeared and said, you know, that he's not worth the, the, the string or the, the bullet or so. And then I don't have soldiers anyway and then you know, take them away to have one best. And so he made all kinds of stupid Bavarian jokes and he was able to persuade those guys, you know, not to, not to hang me or to shoot me or whatever. Usually they did hanging because hanging is a, is a degradation, you know, when you're shot, that's an honor. There's also strange concepts, you know, that when you're shot, that's an honor, and you're hanged, it's not an honor. So, but nevertheless, you know, life hangs just on this little string, you know, it could have gone this way or that way or whatever. So, just think these stories may, may be enough. So, I was then taken prisoner, and I was went to Worms, and there uh, were 30,000 people in one camp, and I got nothing to eat for six days, it was nobody's fault. Uh, too many people surrendered, and so uh, then to Marseille, and then I was brought over here to Norfolk, and, and in that camp I was selected as an um, anti-Nazi because of my membership in the Catholic Youth Movement in Frankfurt, and uh, then I was educated by people from Harvard and Yale, and, uh, um, and then was set free and sent back to, um, to Europe to democratize Germany and 
on the way the numbers were mixed up of the Liberty ship and I finally found myself in the harbor instead of in Hamburg and I was in Polbeck which was an American concentration camp for SS men and at that time they didn't differentiate yet between the SS of the concentration camps and the Waffen SS which was the elite troops by which the, which had the tank armies all in them. Uh, the three million men and the tank armies were all under the leadership of this uh, elite SS. This elite SS later on got pensions again. Only the SS which was involved in the camps uh, was, you know, they were punished as war criminals and so on. But when I came to the camp and we said, you know, we are anti-Nazis, he said, well, all Germans have been anti-Nazis, you know. He behaved like a Nazi himself, the colonel, with a dog, playing with his dog and uh, we had huge uh, sea sacks with full of camels, cigarettes, cigarettes and underwear, whatever. We were supposed to go to the black market in Frankfurt because you cannot eat democracy. You have to eat first before you make democracy. And so um, he took it all and gave it to his coolies. And I went in a tent, it was underwater. Two people were dead. And they didn't tell the commander that they were dead. And they had all these big stomachs and were starving to death. Uh, and uh, so um, horrible conditions. And, French uh, doctors came and we were well fed in the States and strong and uh, so we should either go into the mines in order to work as miners as they did in Russia which was against the Geneva Convention or to pick up mines in the Normandy and then you blew up every few minutes you know and lost your leg or whatever so that was Where also against the Geneva Convention. This is 45 or this is? 45, yeah, 46. So a lot of Nazis have to do this you know in England and uh, they were fought over in the Normandy and, and took, because the maps got lost for the minefields and so uh, you know they had to be picked up by hand uh, somehow so, and uh, I, I did not complain when I came to Frankfurt you know I went to the uh, uh, to the American military government in the IG farm industry building and I did not complain about the starving you know because that was nobody's fault but I did complain about this concentration camp for SS men and uh, I don't know what became of it they put it down and uh, registered it but don't know if they took action about it so nevertheless then I you know started to marketize and I uh, built a party together with Eugen Kogon who is the writer of the SS state you have a book over there and um, and was closely connected with Horkheimer and so on and also Walter Dirks um, very much a left wing journalist and uh, they, uh, they built a journal, the Frankfurt Journal, and Walter knows it for my, and a dozen too. I have collected them all, and it was a Catholic left-wing type of a journal. And um, what we did, we founded a Christian Democratic Party, which was supposed to bring the workers and the Christians together. Because the Germans had a Christian party, the center party, which was only Catholic, not Protestant, and that center party had given Hitler the emergency laws which made him legally into a dictator which uh, Roosevelt did not ask for, he had the New Deal instead so, um, the, uh, so that's what we tried but we didn't come through uh, the workers had deep uh, uh, resentment against the Christians who were all bourgeois they belonged to another class and the, uh, the Christians you know looked at the workers as they were all communists and so finally Adenauer came and he did something else with that same party he um, brought the Protestant, the Catholic bourgeoisie together and let the workers go into the social democratic parties and into the communist parties until they were forbidden, they outlawed so, uh, uh, and so the, the whole, you know, what is now governing at this moment, the Chancellor and, and so on, that is the Christian Democratic Party and on the other side, the other big party is the Social Democratic Party and um, so, and, and I belong then in this Christian Democratic Party, I stayed in that Christian Democratic Party also under Adenauer and it was the left wing which was then able to establish a wonderful uh, social uh, system uh, in terms of pensions for workers and so on and so on which helped a lot you know to make uh, peace in, in Germany at the same time Adenauer hired back all the old Nazis for the army for the security forces and so on and the funny thing was every Nazi whom he brought back the register for the Nazi party was in Pankow in Berlin so then the socialistic press on the other side said this guy did this and this and this and showed all his record there and all the crimes he committed but the West went on anyway so 
<coughs> they simply did not have enough people in order to build up the industry, the military, and, and so on and so on. And so they took all the old Nazis back. And so did the American army. They put all the SS men because they were specialists for Russia and for communism, and so they all hired them. When they were discovered then by the French police or whatever, then they went to the Vatican, to the Croatian seminar in the basement, where they got uh, the um, Eichmann and so on, where they got the false passports, and then they went to Argentine, where the French were. So, um, and uh, that's where then, you know, where they were, uh, Eichmann, who was then by the uh, Jewish Secret Service, Israeli Secret Service was deducted, was taken out and fought in Jerusalem and, and so on. And, 20 years later, yeah. 20 years later, yeah. And so there's uh, nice pieces by Hawkeye by, about the Eichmann process and also by Anna Arbent, of course, and, uh, and that would be something to, to discuss in order to get into the very heart because no, no critical theorist was a Zionist as such, and the question is why they did not become Zionists, why Benjamin did not go to Jerusalem and so on, because very shortly they thought that Judaism had a mission for Europe, that it had a mission in order to reconstruct the spirituality or the culture of, of the West again. And that is why Adorno stayed a long time into the Nazi period and Benjamin stayed a long time. They overstayed their time even uh, writing as journalists anonymously and, and so on. So they didn't want to give up, but particularly Benjamin is a very tragic case. So. Nevertheless, I had to come back, uh, you know, to, I, I studied in Frankfurt, uh, that's when I came in contact with the Frankfurt School, Hockheimer came for some lectures, they really resettled in the 50s, but they came in the late 40s already and um, rebuilt the institute in Frankfurt, it had been bombed out by the American Air Force after it had been stolen by the Nazi cultural minister in Berlin. Um, the house of Hockheimer in the Taunus Mountains had been made an SA headquarter, etc. So they came back and Adorno and Horkheimer decided that they uh, should go back to Germany. Uh, it is amazing, you know, the cities were 80% bombed out. Um, Horkheimer lived in the Frankfurt Hof, which is a hotel. They, they left only the Frankfurt Hof and the railroad station, the bombers, because they, and the IG, IG farm. So they had to have a place where they could govern and a place where they could sleep and a place where they could take a train. So and everything else was bombed out. So. And there were these doors, you know, all kind of at night he went down and there were little wagons with horses and he took all the sugar which he got up there and fed it to the horses there. And some journalists made a, a whole thing out of the feeding operation which he did every night. So, nevertheless, they rebuilt the whole institute again, and uh, the American commissioner paid for it, so part of it. The city of Frankfurt paid a part of it, so, and uh, they had a very favorable moment because horrible injustices had happened from the, of the Jews, and now there was some guilt feeling, and, uh, how come I never trusted it really, but it was, they wanted to make some things good, so he was very well treated, and uh, Adorno also became a professorship in spite of the fact that he uh, did not have a habilitation, uh, or kind of did, and so on. But uh, they made some, you know, made some room for them, and uh, uh, kind of even became president of the Frankfurt University for a short time, uh, where he had to receive Adenauer, whom he did not really like very much, but he had to play the role. So, um, uh, and then I had to come back again, 53, to a leadership course, and I went to the social work department in the Catholic University, and uh, with a leadership emphasis, and I met my wife there, and then three years later we married, with the Bishop of Mainz uh, married us, and there the whole atmosphere very shortly, this Bishop of Mainz, uh, always had been, uh, had been army chaplain, and as an army chaplain, I, I, I looked at the Frankfurt airport there a few years ago, and in the chapel of the airport, there was a little booklet about him, and there was his picture, and in the German uniform, as a wonderful German officer with a swastika uh, up there, and the cross over here, the swastika and the cross all at once. So. And he, um, he was in uh, Russia, and uh, in one tank attack, he was not supposed to fight, but he was standing in the tank anyway, and he was so enthusiastic in order to kill atheistic Bolshevists that he forgot that his feet were freezing off. 
and then they had to operate him without anesthesia and so on and take half of the feet off and he was always walking in a very strange way later on but he also had to stand by when 25,000 Russian children were machine gunned down and he couldn't say a thing except praying his rosary and his Protestant counterpart didn't even pray the rosary when he was just standing there so um, I mean this is un unmeasurable uh, simply because there was a concordance there was a concordance between the Vatican and Hitler uh, in which arranged the uh, army chaplains and how they had to behave as moral officers and, so on. and they all had it here on their belt God with us you know they were marching all, the SS had that so when he couldn't march right anymore they sent him to Paris into an SS a prison where the SS uh, you know executed people every morning and the SS also had God with us and the SS also had army chaplains so every morning he went to the wall there was somebody and said a prayer or what when a communist he couldn't even do that and then had to pray uh, send a you know, letter to the parents or whatever sometimes German soldiers deserters or resistance people or whatever they were shooting all the time and he always went there with, with, to the wall and not protesting or whatever and when he came back and they see why Christianity is in the crisis you know why all and so on uh, the people in Auschwitz they were all all the SS people were all baptized Christians they were either Catholic or Protestant this Hitler there who stood there he was a Catholic he went he was educated by priests his wife went to a nunnery school and, and so on so Goering who stood beside him was a good Protestant you know was a part of baptized Protestant and so on. so that Christianity is in a miserable shape you know after all that is obvious you know we could say what Islam and you know this is another story so and nevertheless then he wanted to resign you know uh, from the priesthood which would have been the decent thing to do but uh, he didn't he let himself be promoted into a seminary director and uh, you know educated again uh, young priests who had all come from the fronts many of them were opposition of mines mines yeah yeah and uh, so they all had shed blood you know there was a law once that uh, somebody who had shed blood could never become a priest and on that basis the priests were not supposed to to go into war but maybe in a hospital help in a hospital but they should not take up a gun but in all the war 70 war 14 war it, it was all cancelled and they fought anyway so and uh, and of course you know he wrote a lot about love but when there was somebody coming from East Germany who wanted to become a priest and was a socialist they fired him right away the hate against socialism you know remained untouched by all these horrible events so and to when, whenever you know, the critical theorists say something about religion or whatever you have to think what experiences they had you know it is almost like, like the atheists who have that song every week maybe I've heard it you know we are not afraid of Yahweh we are not afraid of Jesus we are not afraid of Allah we are afraid of what you do in their name we are afraid of what you are doing in their name and that is true now and that was true uh, at that time as well so um, sometimes I give sermons still in the church in which I grew up and there are then old little ladies sitting in there whose sons died in Stalingrad and so on up to today you know you cannot tell them the truth really you know your son was part of three million men who invaded another country super gangsters and criminals and so on you know what can you say to a, to a mother and so on there is this um, this we story have hmm? we do have this oh my god and how long does it go tonight tonight okay very good so let me stop it then to you know so that we have this behind it so you know a little bit about my background and, and what the contacts are and how I so the first lectures which I heard from them was from Hockheim and Adorno but the real contacts came through uh, to, uh, to Walter Dietz who was a good friend of Adorno and also through um, to um, Coburn and then later on Metz who is the father of the liberation theology and the new political theology was very closely connected with Adorno too Adorno wanted to hire him even and uh, Bloch was very much in the picture in terms of uh, um, the, the new types of theology which developed in, in Germany and so I was very much in, involved in also with Metz we are good friends and Hans Küng we are good friends Hans Küng would be a center Hegelian Metz would be a left wing Hegelian 
and they have trouble in their own church. For instance, Ratzinger, as you know, the cardinal and now Benedict, uh, repressed the uh, new theology and particularly the, uh, um, the liberation theology because he said that uh, that it politicized religion and that therefore it would uh, be an attack against the religious element and therefore he stopped it and of course in the service and uh, in the interest of the American um, holding class which is very much interested in cheap labor in these areas and uh, these liberation theologians they want to have justice now and uh, were mixed up with the communists which they were not uh, communists wanted to have total nationalization they, liberation the other Jesuits who were killed in um, six of them and Bishop Romero and so on they wanted to the capitalist system could be, would be okay if they would be adequate if they would pay adequate wages but adequate wages would also mean a diminishment of the profit rate and the communists you know wanted to do away with the whole profit rate and so they looked very similar for the Arena party which is the fascist party in El Salvador and uh, so that's why all this killing went on, 70,000 people were killed there. So uh, they had opposition from outside and in their own church and many of these liberation theologians who were trained by Metz and Metz was trained by the Frankfurt School. So if you read Gutierrez for instance, you will see in Gutierrez's book there's Marcuse, there's Fromm and, and so the whole Frankfurt School had uh, tremendous influence on, on these people. and. Uh, but sometimes Paul VI, for instance, would quote from, so they were willing to learn too. Habermas had, uh, had a discourse with, uh, with uh, Colonel Ratzinger, and, uh, but then, you know, the question is if Habermas is not a traitor, so the left will save us, of course. So, but we want to leave those open things, you know, moving and open and not fix anything dogmatically. Uh, so, on. so that is all what I have to say about this. So we have our uh, story there, and uh, um, as far very short the syllabus. If you can get the syllabus from my website, you all have my website HTTP, right, and, and so on and so on. And please take from the website the syllabus, and take from the website my biographical thing there. And then on the website there is also a website publications A B C D, which is our uh, world map there, which can help us a little bit, you know, to sort things out. So if you could do that, that would be beautiful. As far as the uh, uh, um, uh, syllabus is concerned, there is, a, a, you know, summary of what we want to do here. Then there are the themes, and we have the second theme tonight. And then there is, as far as the uh, reading is concerned, so uh, we have two types of reading. One is to get into the dialectical thinking, so it's for some of us maybe a new thing. And so I have this one here, um, there, and there are two stories, there, chapter 2 and 6 are stories, and which, uh, which are a little bit easier to, to digest, and the other ones are mainly about Habermas and, uh, and then his students. So that would be our first background reading. And then uh, we have uh, one background reading a month, and uh, one depth study, and the depth study is also in the syllabus. You can take, you know, the older Prometheus, or you can take a new one. And Walter has just uh, uh, got a list of uh, names by uh, Axel Honneth, who is now the, the director of the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research. And there are a few of his books which have been translated so that we have it in English. Um, so we are particularly concerned, you know, with the newer ones, American ones and German ones. He would be a good uh, third generation. The fourth generation has not been translated enough. But the third generation, we have translations uh, of the... Uh, so of the books there, uh, social action, human nature, and, and whatever. So, um, and therefore, recently, some of them, 2003, 2007. Um, so, um, I can give you that. Uh, they're already in here. They're already in there. Uh, where? Where are they? Okay, very good. In your syllabus? Yeah. All of them are in there already? Yes. So I put, oh, I put them in there already. Okay, very good. But, I mean, so what you can do is you can, for instance, concentrate on Axel Hornet if you want to. Uh, take one of his books every month. Or you can, if, you, if it's a little bigger one, they are not too big, they're small. Uh, but you could take one of them for the whole semester. And that would become your specialty then. 
Um, and what we can do is um, that each of us uh, makes one of these critical theorists his own and uh, then maybe that you give us a short report don't write a paper but just uh, put some points down and say look I read this Honest you know the first three chapters or whatever that's what I think about I didn't understand a word of what he's saying <laughs> so could you explain things and so on so, uh, and that we could all do that maybe just in alphabetical order and then we turn it around um, so if you take the same book then you can the next month you can report about the same book and say I have proceeded now and so on so that would be one way but you can also take you know him and then take somebody else you know in the next semester even an older one or a younger one or so um, wherever you stand personally then that's what you can choose and whatever time you have and so on but then, as far as the text, uh, tests are concerned, we would have one uh, in the first week of February, one in the first week of um, March, and then maybe the second week of April. <coughs> and there will be two options. Either that we put together, that I put together, let's see, a few questions, 25 questions, and you answer six, uh, let's see, in essay form, to take home, you take it home. And, um, or you can take, uh, there will be two questions, one about the background reading, the other one about the depth study. You can take that depth study thing and can make a paper out of this and don't have to answer the 25, uh, the 25 questions. But uh, instead of that, write about the man whom you have chosen and uh, in whom you are now a specialist. And then, you know, write this instead of, instead of the text. That will be your form. Then you have a choice, whatever you want to do. These two options. Okay. So you're saying uh, the first week of every month is oh. background readings, which are uh, your Hegel book. Yeah, or, or this one or another one. Yeah, right. So we'll do that. And then throughout the month, we'll off the reading list, we'll pick any number of no, no simpler. Uh, just choose for January. Mm -hmm. This would be the background reading for January. And then you choose one of the critical theorists. Right? So you have two books uh, a month. And then we will have another background reading and you can choose another uh, depth study or the same one. You can continue the same. So, so, so you have in the end choice throughout the yeah, entire yeah. school right. of, of Adorno, right. yeah. Horkheimer, whatever you want to, yeah. Except that we wanted to to emphasize the newer ones a little bit, but we are not bound by this. And that's all in, in the in the reading. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you wanted an overview of all the Frankfurt School first and second generation, what is it? It's the Green Book, the Frankfurt School Reader. The Reader, yeah. Yeah. The uh, library has it. ADE books, you can get a cheap copy of it. Uh, I think you know it's like 20 bucks. And if you want a more, in, because that will just be articles by them on t particular subject matters. If you want a broad overview, get the Introduction to the Critical Theory by David Held, which is about 400 pages long, and uh, you can read different thoughts, uh, ideas that they have, but it does more intense. Uh, you know. yeah. I would like to, you know, since it's a humanistic type of a thing, that, uh, and humanism is always ad fontes, you know, to go to the sources, that one doesn't take an overview or so, but take a real guy. I mean, this real form, yeah. you know, Walter is a form specialist that Dustin uh, um, has worked with Adorno and, and Heidegger and, and that's so That's why the reader is so good, because those yeah. are, you know, their articles, Marcuse and from yeah. and Adorno and Walter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you can take those out of but uh, you can also choose a book, you know, for whatever it is, you know. It, it depends how much you know already, you know, as you come here. And, so, and if you don't know too much, then it would be better maybe to take an older one, you know, to, just to get into the whole thing. But we want to go to the people themselves, not commentaries about them. I mean, they're okay too. But, um, you know, the commentator has a perspective and so on. So, um, therefore, we want to go to the real people, either the first generation, second generation, or the third generation, or the fourth, if you want to. You know, the very young ones who are now working in the, in the Institute, usually on labor union questions, on uh, right-wing extremism questions, racism, and so on. That is what they are doing. Okay. So, for, for the next maybe two weeks, yeah. what, are, what are we... Um, 
what kind of goals do we have? Yeah, that we have. There is a whole list of themes, and we we don't have we don't have to follow these themes. Now, but it shows us, you know, certain program how we want to proceed. Right? And you have that all in the syllabus. You also have the objectives which we want to reach. And uh, as far as grading is concerned, you know, you get a grade for each uh, our, our sessions here. Uh, so if uh, you just listen or so, then you get a B, and if you make a commentary or so, you get an A, and you will go to heaven. So I need somehow this, I want to do this right away. So Elizabeth, um, yes, okay, very good. So that is the second grade which you get now, because you have already won for the first one. Then Nicholas, yeah, that okay, very good. So whoever says something, and Dustin Bird, and uh, then uh, John too, very good. So uh, that we do this bureaucratic stuff there, and um, you all accumulate capital here. There is Walter. What kind of capital? Uh, intellectual capital. <laughs> okay, so you have something like human capital. So. Okay, and the next time we will also start with the movies, and I thought maybe the conspiracy here would be a good starting point. That means um, since the school was born, you know, in an anti-nationalistic, anti-fascist, and so on, so it would be good the context against which these texts are written, you know. And so that is what we want to do in terms of, so we, unlike the diet, we want to have you know, a little bit more time for looking at analyzing things. So that would be, you know, the meeting here of the, uh, um, the what was it, uh, one say, the one say meeting. Uh, yeah, and to, just to get into the whole spirit, uh, unspirit of the whole thing. Okay, now do we meet in my house the next time? Sure. But we have to be sure that everybody can make it and wants to make it, right? Do you have a car? 6.30 Piccadilly? Uh, I have a class that goes till 6.20. Yeah. So, um, it... Come a little bit later. Come a little bit later. Yeah. yeah. Can I turn it in? That's fine. Yeah, just come in. But you can make it. And you have a car. So, it's 6.30 Piccadilly. Uh, and we meet at 7, right? It's a little bit more comfortable. You know, we can sit and we also have... A 7 instead of 6.30? Oh, no, 6.30. Yeah, 6.30. I mean, I should we do You come with... 6.40, I'll be You can't come with... You can't miss it. You'll see how it's out of the day. It's really easy to We can wait for you, okay? But are you sure that you all can make it? Up West Main? Piccadilly. Third house... On the right. This is the third house. Yeah. Peace Peaceful. Peace pole. Peace Peace pole. Yes. There is a peace pole sticking out of the snow. Which one? Which one? Did I buy this one? Yeah. Reality check. Yes. No, I didn't buy this one. The, the, the second second uh, chapter first. Was this one even in the? No. It's in there. Was it? Was that in the library? Yeah. Which is the library? Is the, no, no, not the, the bookstore. In the bookstore? Yeah. I don't know. Which one is the one that I bought? Like we do. It, 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 it was large. It's not very religious. Yeah. yeah. I found yeah. it. I found 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 it. Uh, okay. are Jewish, yeah. and so you know when these workers came and put her stuff on on the bed, she thought the pogrom was coming. She <laughs> was so she saw the poor girl. We had to rescue her. Yeah, but the city took responsibility for it, so yeah. the city paid for it. That was good. Yeah.
Okay, very good. Then we meet uh, in my house, right? The week from today. Wow, the week from today, yes. When is Martin Luther King's Day? Monday. Monday. It's Monday, so Monday is free, but we meet on Wednesday. Yes.